I would like to introduce Perry Desmond Davies, who comes to us today from Maynard, Massachusetts. I think she just stepped off the plane from New Orleans, um, and we're very happy that she is here back in Massachusetts today with us. When Perry was growing up, she confesses to being a tomboy and loved being outdoors. She started playing guitar at age nine. Her big brother Dave taught her then. She went on to play at local venues, uh, Hampton Beach Hot Coffee Houses in the mid-70s as a teen. And then she put music away for a while as she had a family and a career to tend to and also went back to school. So it was many years later, 16 years ago, and she went to attend some live acoustic music events. And Perry said, it all came flowing back just by sitting in the audience and listening at that time. The love of sharing voice and songs in an intimate environment. And uh, Perry said she appreciated see seeing how the listeners related um, to the performers there, and that got her inspired to start again as a singer-songwriter and uh, she has loved the ride since then in writing songs and performing them out and getting great feedback from people about how her songs connect with them. And she's been a finalist in songwriting competitions such as Portsmouth Prescott Park and Susquehanna Songwriting Competition. She has two CDs and her song Sweet Ride from her second CD has aired locally and in the UK and Canada and has been on Car Talk. And when asked why share poetry and songs in the world, Perry said, whether we may or may not think we'll recognize ourselves in someone else's words, ultimately we do. And it's a gift to be on both the giving and receiving end of it. So we look forward to receiving some of Perry's original songs this morning, and I'd like to invite you to please give her a warm welcome up to the stage, Perry Desmond Davis. Jackie's looking regal as usual. Dripping gold and Prada, she's a sight to see. She blew, she flew in from Boca just to be with us today. She'll rest up at the Ritz and then she'll fly back home again. Across the room, there's Mary. From the projects No Boca jet for her She takes two buses and a train She'll be infused for hours Then she'll make her way back home Tonight she'll have to be at work The graveyard shift again I was 
to our lives outside these doors. So we'll gather up our coats and our courage, put our game face on, and our lives go on. Miss Jackie, I'll be thinking of you. Hey, be good, Mary. so much. Thank you. Um, my mom was a patient at Dana-Farber for a couple of years. She had multiple myeloma and she didn't pass away from that, but um, it was really striking. I would bring her for treatments and uh, it just kind of, one day when I was there, that, that just kind of realization that, you know, the people that are here are different in their way and the struggle that they're going through. And this is somewhat of a place of comfort to be in this clinic where they don't have to worry about what they look like if they're not feeling good and going through stuff. So. Bring up the uh, mood just a little bit here. This one's for Cheryl.
And these songs are on my CD that's back there, and uh, there's some beautiful harmony on that one that I can't exactly uh, replicate here. <laughs> I write songs about life and love and kind of everything in between. And um, my experience is, as Cheryl said, that people relate to and I relate to others. So the goal is to share the music. This is a song that uh, I wrote for a, um, an appearance on NECN a couple years ago. I was going to be on the coffee house that they are having and then found out that my appearance was going to be on September 11th. And Ruth Ann Baylor, who many of you should know, um, came to me and said, you know, they, they don't want you to sing the happy song, which I'm not doing today, unfortunately, but I have a, I have a happy folk song. And, it, and it's pretty sarcastic. And she said, they, they really don't want you to do that. They're hoping you can do something else that's a little bit more to the moment. So I said, well, you know, I have a song that I've started, but I didn't finish it um, on September 11th. And she said, well, you've got 10 days. That's what you're going to be doing. So I really, I, I owe Ruth Ann a lot for uh, pushing me into finishing this because um, I've been very happy to have um, written this and there are some places that you can sing along and I would appreciate it if you would.
I could stay right here forever Let me stay Thank you very much. It's on first encountering Zimmer's poems while drinking decaf behind the deli at 10.10 10 a.m. and experiencing the clarification of a substantial hangover and remembering I was recently mistaken for Zimmer three times in one exciting day. <laughs> this doppelganger business is no joke. Not when you are 55 and discover that the other, the one who is like you, who is supposed to be alive and unknown in Asia or Australia, well, famous there perhaps, just unknown to you, as you are to him. Though, of course, you too are famous here if one is willing to define fame narrowly enough, and I am. <laughs> anyway, your double is supposed to appear to you in a final dream on your deathbed, or you are supposed to appear in a final dream on his deathbed. The TV mystic who is dead, but because of the miracle of tape, keeps talking and talking to Moyers, the southern guy who is interviewing 37 hours a day. And as the mystic speaks, you have no idea what he's talking about, but you feel your life changing. Well, anyway, even if he is not clear on which double appears to whom, or maybe he was clear and I just forgot. Anyway, one of us appears to the other, okay? and says, I am your long lost twin brother and I still am lost, but my life gives meaning to your life as yours does to mine. Well, I have to go now, so long, see you. Actually, it's nicer the other way, I'll go and he dies. I'd really like to see Asia or Australia as the case may be. But the fact is he's not here and this is no dream. He's here at the Mount Holyoke Writers' Conference and according to his book, this man has stolen my life well, not my life, exempli gratinae, not my wife, my daughter, my dog, my dog's choke collar. He's training me not to try to make him heal. But my feelings and my experience of life, which is the one decent thing about being 55, you have more experience than you used to. And he has been writing about the era of my history and the big stuff that made me so angry and disgusted with humankind or in love with it. And I realized, sitting here with the blinding clarity deposited by the red ants now making nests in all my blood cells, that Zimmer never let his life get so scary he can't go back and think and write about it. And I too often have, so that reading Zimmer today, I understand what James Wright meant when he lay in that summer field <clears throat> and watched that hawk floating high overhead and said, I have wasted my life because not to remember is to waste the one thing that may really be sacred. And as I continue to look into Zimmer's book, my eyes fill with pale pink bloodshot tears as the memories come trotting up like puppies with slippers in their mouths. Each slipper stamped, Zimmer was here. But I'm not mad or sad, just glad he was, and all of you whose presence has been, is, and will be the DNA of my life. And I'm glad the Mount Holyoke Writers' Conference is no dream. And this day is not my deathbed, but in a way my birthing bed, because this is my natal day. I'm 55. And after all, as it turned out, Squires was here too. Thank you. Body surfing at Narragansett. It seemed like such a good idea. Heading to the beach. The water was warm and the waves were high and just within my reach. I poised myself to surf right in and laid atop a wave, when suddenly a rogue snuck up, requiring I be saved. Although I was injured, I managed to drive home. And if nothing else, I decided this could be a great new poem. <laughs> Thank you.